Yeah, Mr. McMullen, uh, let's start with when you worked for News of the World um, yeah. about the hacking. You, you described it as quite routine, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I actually uh, said that it had been overused and it should have been our bosses, Rebecca Brooks and Andy Coulson, should have reined it back in, but it was just allowed to... <coughs> there had been some fantastic results as a result of it, and people just started almost using it as the first result instead of the last result. And um, instead of hacking people where it's just justified, as I would say, for example, a politician who's being caught with his trousers around his ankles uh, while presenting himself as a happily married man to the electorate, um, it started to be used well on our readers, if you like, ordinary men and women and indeed victims, as we found out. Yeah. And it would still be justified now, despite all what's been happen uh, happening in the past two weeks? Yeah, I've always maintained that... Um, you know, in a free and open society, in a democracy, uh, the only people who really police the behaviour of those in power is a free press. And, uh, you know, what is wrong with having, um, you know, politicians who behave responsibly because they think they're going to get caught out if they don't? So the, the net effect, I've always said, is, you know, the more journalists can do to investigate people and may stray into a, the grey area of illegality in order to do it. But if, uh, you know, if you do catch politicians, you know, basically lying and cheating, stealing money from the electorate, their expenses, and presenting a fake image of themselves, then it is justified. You mentioned politicians, but it seems the main business of a newspaper like News of the World was exposing yeah. celebrities and who they're sleeping with. That's true and I think there's two points about that because let's say you hack into Hugh Grant's phone and you find out he's seeing uh, whatever a new girlfriend or whatever or cheating on his old girlfriend with someone else. Now let's say you get that result. <coughs> um, for a start he's been in uh, a Murdoch movie, he's taken the money, he earns up to five million pounds a movie and um, if you just ask anyone in the town where I come from, would you swap £200 a week as a labourer uh, and live in privacy, or would you have five million quid and be in, in a movie and have your phone hacked into, 99 to 100% would say, yeah, of course we would. You know? And also, he's the guy who's prancing around in front of a camera. He's sold his privacy already. So people had no sympathy for when it was just Sienna Miller and when it was just Hugh Grant and people like that. No one had any sympathy for them. And the other point is because those stories produce a lot of interest, the News of the World, when I started, they were selling more than five million copies every week. And so that's a really powerful tool. So once every month or two, when you do a worthy story in the public interest, I mean, there's many. Uh, think of the Pakistan cricket scandal, uh, and also politicians, uh, you know, lying and cheating again. Uh, because they're in a tabloid supported by showbiz tittle tattle, the sort of people who wouldn't normally read it if it was tucked away in the Independent, which sells only a hundred thousand, it has much bigger impact. Therefore, democracy is served better. So you say it, we need the celebrity news to. Be up. able to expose politicians effectively. And also the money. The, it is so expensive doing an investigation. I mean, people look at the internet these days and all the websites and just see lots of information. That's most, a lot of it's rubbish and a lot of it is stolen from newspapers. Because, I'll get, give you an example. Um, I did a story recently where um, I, had to, I couldn't get a number of a guy in Switzerland, so I had to drive down, knock on his door, get a quote about the state of his marriage, one line, drive all the way back again, and it cost more than £2,000 for one line of quote, a, a quote in a story. And if you don't have a show, be, um, you know, a big mass circulation newspaper, you won't be able to do that. Yeah. Another time, I spent three months outside a prison governor's house in a surveillance van because he was sneaking female prisoners out of the prison. So I was catching him with the women he was coming out. Um, and that's massively expensive, you know, I mean, two or three hundred pounds a day for me to be there for three months. I mean, the story must have cost twenty, thirty thousand pounds. And that isn't as interesting as, you know, Victoria Beckham painting her toenails, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's got had a place uh, that was, that allowed 
the, the newspaper to make lots of money while still having its public interest defense to all the other activities. To go back to the hacking, you say yeah. people have no sympathy for people like you, Grant. Yeah. Is having no sympathy, does it justify to hack somebody's phone, although he's a celebrity? I think it does, because if he doesn't like it anymore, he can just get off the stage and no one will be interested in him anymore. But it seems like what the News of the World did was more like a fishing expedition, just a dragnet and then we see what's coming out. Is that justified? Um, yes, because if you've got nothing to hide, then there's no, no secret there. I mean, for example, uh, I'll give you an example. I mean, I'm, I've been divorced, so uh, when I was newly married, uh, I, I let my wife answer my phone for me and take my messages. But when the marriage started going wrong and I started you know, having an affair, I wouldn't let her anywhere near my mobile because I had something to hide. So basically, people only need their privacy to cover up bad things. I mean, privacy needs to be seen as, I don't know if it's an evil, but it's certainly bad. I mean, you, you know, privacy is the bad space where people do bad things. So if you've done nothing bad, then there's no problem. But to, to, to go to name the example of the cricket scandal, which, which yeah. the News of the World exposed, yeah. there you had a clue that something was wrong, and that's when you start using a techniques that maybe you can call illegal, but yeah. you could say they are justified. It's different from, we don't know anything about this person, but just let's hack and see what comes out. Can't you see there's a difference in it? I can see the difference, but fundamentally my job was only to write the truth about well, I, I was a journalist, just keeping the journal of the day, just writing the truth about what I saw. And <coughs> I would, everyone has a little specialist area, and you sort of know the stars you get to know, you know their, about their life, and you sort of home in on them. And there were a few stars that I would routinely target just because I sort of quite liked them. And uh, even when nothing was going on, I would. I quite like Steve Coogan, so I just used to go and park outside his house for a few hours just to see what he was doing, and got a great story when he got back with his wife. So, oh, great! You know, from, you know. so um, we had a stand-up row on TV. I don't know if you saw yeah, it in Holland. Right. Yeah. So, um, and well, you that still was, think that's justified? Well, it was justified for me because I just lived about half a mile around the block, so it's very close to do. Uh, but the hacker's phone then? Um, well. Um, I, I, again, I, I see no issue with it. I mean, okay, so he's a comedian and he's a big show off and he spends his life mucking about in front of a camera. I, I don't, you know, is his private life different? Um, but isn't it tricky because there's no law in this land that decides or oh, this person is famous or not? So it's basically you deciding. So if you say, oh, this person is a celebrity, so I can hack him, um, you've got a lot of power in your hands. What I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, that, that's that's true. If you have, you know, grubby little secrets, um, and if we have a privacy law, which means that you know journalists are going to be sent to jail. Well, it already is against the law to hack into people's phone, and journalists have been sent to jail. But if there's a law of privacy, all it's really going to do is the same as you know anti-drug laws do. They're going to make secrets a bit like heroin, and the price is just going to go up. So it will backfire and. Again, um, it never used to be against the law. You used to be able to sit outside someone's house and listen to the conversation on a scanner. You could buy in a shop. It was only changed, it was changed Europe-wide, the European Court of Human Rights, I think, and pri privacy, whatever, in 2001. But the people who were overjoyed that it, it became illegal were the politicians who were you know, cheating on their wives and cheating the public, lying and cheating, and you know, these people make decisions about, you know, sending our boys to Afghanistan who come back in body bags, and you want to have decent, honourable people making those diff difficult decisions for you. And how, how do you judge if someone is a, you know, decent and honourable? Well, if he, you look at his private, personal life, and if he dishonours his wife, then maybe you think, well, I don't think he should make decisions about who's going to die in which foreign country. But everybody makes mistakes. Yeah. Nobody's perfect. Well, excellent, sir. And if you're a politician, everyone should know about them because everyone's going to be asked to vote for you. Is it justified to hack a phone like what happened with Millie Dowler? You know, that, uh, if I tried to defend that, I don't think I'd bother. If, if this was going to go out in England, I wouldn't even try to defend that. But fundamentally, the paper was just trying to 
help find the girl. Um, they were printing pictures of the missing girl on the front page, pictures of uh, CCTV, images of cars that had gone by to help try and catch the possible abductor. Um, what the paper was trying to do was good. Uh, Hugh Grant said it was evil, but it, it wasn't. The, the, the result, the wanted result, was the same as the police wanted, and the paper was cooperating with the police to put the pictures in to try and catch who it might have been. But, now, um, funnily enough, I was on the World Service and people ring in from Kenya and Nairobi, and a guy from Kenya, the first time I've ever heard it, I thought, oh, thanks, mate. He said, maybe it was a good idea to have a lot of uh, clever young journalists investigating as well, because the police don't do a very good job. The police took seven years to find the killer. You know, there is no Hercule Poirot in the British police force. They were making a complete pig's ear of it. So you could argue that something good may have come of that. Pro problem is, he deleted it and the phone came back to life and a uh, parent myself, I can hardly imagine what that must have put the parents through. But mm. So basically you're saying you, you could argue that even in this case phone hacking is justified but deleting was a step too far. I suppose that's what I'm saying but um, this is why I've bought a pub in the south, Co south of England in Dover and for the last three weeks I haven't been able to stand behind my own bar because I wouldn't even, if this was being aired in Britain, I wouldn't say that because I'd just get a punch on the nose. Because the people, that's the problem, it's such an emotional subject. People just always go for the easy emotion. Um, and um, Like with News of the World. Indeed, well it sells copies, but people should stop and think and say, well actually this was a terrible thing and we feel ever so sorry for the dreadful crime and what a lovely sweet girl and all the anguish of her family. If you try and set that emotional response aside and just think that bad mistake that a private investigator made may you know, reduce the quality of the democracy we live in. It may bring in a privacy law that um, will allow politicians to continue cheating, lying and stealing from us. But can't you see there's a bit of a contradiction here? You see people tend to go with the easy emotion, but that's how news of the world made that money. It, it is indeed, but I mean, there's a greater good at stake. The greater good is a free and open society. And how is it gonna, how is the, the, the media landscape gonna change after this, do you think? Well, um, one of my favorite images um, of the last 10, or 15, no, maybe 20 years uh, about newspapers, because newspapers are declining and dying anyway. But I remember when Czechoslovakia got its first free newspaper after um, years in the communist bloc and there was a pickup truck full of uh, newspapers and one guy standing at the back driving slowly crowds of people running after the pickup truck to get a newspaper that actually was free for the first time in years and we have that in Britain and we're just throwing it away uh, people in other parts of the world are dying to get a free press and we're happy just to say oh we don't want it oh, it's invading our privacy I mean, people have got to stop and think. This could be a really bad thing that's about to happen in Britain. So what is going to happen then? What, what could threaten it? Um, well, um, for a start, what sort of a free society is jails its journalists? I mean, all I've ever done is try to write honest, well-researched, truthful articles, and yet I face the jail. I've, uh, jail, I've got a letter from a police officer asking me to come in to be interviewed under caution, so I will be arrested. I mean, I, I said no, but you know, five, six, or seven of my colleagues have been arrested and one already jailed. That's something that should happen. Ha happened in Stalinist Russia, not in Britain in 2011. Uh, what? what How is it going to change? Um, well, I don't know, but I hope it doesn't turn out like France, which used to have mass circulation papers and then went all the way down, because if you have to give permission for, say, even your photograph. Yeah. I think in France you have to give your permission, otherwise you're invading someone's privacy. Uh, look at the mess their country's in. You've got President Mitterrand having secret love children, living, you know, being chauffeured around in um, government cars, uh, and everyone sort of knowing, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, but no one knew about it for 30 years until the girl herself started talking about it. So. Um, but that's one extreme. 
could yeah. you say like Britain is maybe the other extreme and you may need to move a little bit from the edges away? It, it was when I first started when, under Piers Morgan, my first editor, it was such fun. It was great. There's no laws against it. And so at the moment, uh, when I first started, you could buy a scanner and just listen to people's mobile phone conversations. Didn't have to listen to their messages because you've got the absolute conversation. Um, and now, 2011, the only people who can do that is the government. I mean, which society would you prefer to live in? Actually, I prefer to live in the free one because, you know, I'm not doing anything wrong. You can have my PIN code. I've got no secrets to hide because I, you know, it's a free... <coughs> if you're going to have a, a free society where people can engage in things like, for example, an, the right to have an abortion. Now, if you're going to have that, you really should say that that shouldn't be made secret um, and it should be something that you must do in public. I mean, for a couple of reasons. One reason is um, that, you know, for example, if uh, you know, a woman may have done it against her husband's wishes or tried to keep it a secret and she becomes famous and becomes a big star in EastEnders or some soap opera, that grubby little secret in her past is going to have a huge value and it's going to be very damaging to her you know, mental health. Or, and people are driven to suicide by the secrets in their past. And if you don't have, if you start seeing privacy as a good thing, when in reality it's a terrible thing, um, uh, society will not be improved. So you would be saying actually make phone hacking legal again? Absolutely, and put, get, put the scanners back in the shops. It's now illegal to own a scanner. The only person with a legal scanner is, I think, MI5. Yeah. Um, if you look, do, do you still talk to to colleagues or former colleagues from the newspaper? Well, they're all former colleagues. Well, right? no. Well, funnily enough, um, I um, a colleague and a friend, um, James Weatherup, who's recently been arrested. When he got arrested. Uh, I texted him, I said, it's because I'd been asked in for questioning as well. So I said, when you get arrested, do you just keep saying no comment, no comment? And uh, I didn't get a text back, so I asked someone else. They said, oh, the cops have got his phone, you're just texting the police. <laughs> so, uh, no, I don't know what his number is anymore. Um, so, yes, some, some of my colleagues, former co well, one of them, said, am I allowed to use the F word? I don't know. Yeah, not so, Dutch TV. <laughs> yeah, he said, uh, the first one, after the first interview about it, it's like, will you just shut up? And the second one was, shut the fuck up. And then more, shut the fucking hell up, will you? So, But other people uh, think uh, that's quite an interesting take on it. Uh, at least you're defending good journalism. Good journalism, Oof, not everyone thinks that. Uh, at least you're defending the right to have, uh, you know, uh, investigative journalism in the public interest which on occasion it is. Well, so why do, you, do they tell you to shut up? Why, why, why do, you, do you think you're damaging them? Well I think before the paper closed um, people thought I was being indiscreet. I, I didn't think I was. I thought I was... Um, honest? Uh, yeah, honest, yeah. Saying well this, this is the way it is. What's wrong with that? And we've got a, one of the biggest... I mean it, how great is that? We've got the biggest selling English language newspaper in the world, bigger than any European newspaper. There's only one, in the Times of China sells more. I think maybe there's one in India now. Times of India. Is it? Yeah, yeah. it sells more as well. Doesn't it? Fewer readers than the news of the world. It has fewer readers. They have three million uh, okay. newspapers. They sell about, I think, six million readers. So oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, OK. Um, talking about honesty, are, are Rebecca Brooks and Andy Coulson honest? Uh, no, uh, that's how it all started, actually. That's first time I mentioned Rebecca Brooks was to Hugh Grant when he came into the bar and we just had a conversation over a beer <coughs> and then when I found out he was tape recording me secretly just like I used to do to him which I thought was hilarious by the way I didn't find it bad at all and um, that's the first time I said oh Rebecca Brooks she knew all about it yeah what a liar she is um, to, to him and then he put the tape on the internet and gave it to the police and all that so uh, I can't really take that back because I've already said it so publicly. So they knew about what was happening within the newspaper, they must have known. Yeah, yeah, no, very much so, yeah. I mean, uh, the, uh, my fellow whistleblower, if you like, Sean Hoare, who died two days, at three days ago, um, he was a good friend of Andy Coulson's at the start, they used to do it together, and then they fell out, and that's then he decided, 
I'm going to tell the truth of the way he ordered me to do it, how he asked for transcripts uh, of the hacked conversations. Was but it the truth <coughs> as far as you know what Sean Hoare told? Oh yeah, no, I, <coughs> I thought, I didn't like the position Rebecca Brooks and Andy Coulson took because they effectively said, um, oh, you know, it wasn't us, oh, it was those reporters. Um, yeah, blame them, nothing to do with us, but we were doing it for them. You're our bosses, you should be standing up for us. I mean, if Rebecca Brooks and Andy Coulson had stood up and said, OK, <coughs> we think that it can be in the public interest that for free press and to catch politicians out, it's OK to break the law because fundamentally the politicians made this law to stop themselves getting caught, so it's a bad law and we have to fight against this, then I'd have had a lot of respect for them. Instead, they said, oh, yeah, it was him, arrest him, Not it wasn't me. So it's like... Like Sean Hoare, did Coulson or Brooks ask you to do those things? Um, I did many things. Uh, well, you see, I've got a lawyer sitting on my shoulder now who says, uh, you've implicated yourself enough, don't do it anymore. So, um, I, I mean, I did. our department did many things like that. Um, but you're not uh, saying it was ordered by them? Oh, I see what you mean. Um, like Sean Hoare said, Andy Coulson asked me to do those things, literally. Yeah, yeah, well... And for, because I got on so badly with Andy Coulson, we hardly spoke to each other. I, I called him, I insulted him more or less on his first day. I didn't, some people you take an instant dislike to. He was always immaculately turned out and um, spoke like an executive. And it's like, well, why can't he speak to me normally? And like, he used to sit there about, you know, four feet away and he, he would ring me up. It's like, well, why don't you just talk to me? So I'm deputy editor. And it's like, oh, so I was openly rude to him, so we didn't have a good relationship, so he wouldn't have uh, really asked me to do anything when really. we sort of avoided each other. What you've said, you, 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 your lawyer says you've, you've implicated you, uh, yourself enough already. Yeah. The things you have said, yeah. would you be willing to say those things to the police? No, I, I'm going to take the line Sean Hall took and just say no comment. I'm not here to... Uh, but not as a witness? No, I'm not here to help the police at all. I've got, I don't care about the police. I mean, I pay my taxes. I mean, if someone breaks into my house, I want them to come and arrest them, but this is nonsense. They can uh, force you, though. Um, they can't force me to say... They well, can arrest you, I mean. Oh, they can arrest me, but then they haven't got any evidence. And I know they haven't, because the private investigator I regularly used has got rid of all, his, all of his records. They've contacted you, though. Well, they have. I mean, I, really, I have... A, this is the last letter. Uh, Detective Superintendent Dean Hayden, after I turned it down um, <coughs> a couple of times, when they said, you will come into Scotland Yard tomorrow voluntarily to be arrested, I went, well, I volunteer not to. Obviously. But would they treat you as a witness or as a suspect then? As a suspect. And that's why I couldn't go. Uh, in initially, I said, well, if you want to treat me as a witness, then maybe I could be a witness. But actually, as you said, I'm going to arrest you and uh, everything you say will, can be used against you under caution. Um, it, 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 well, that's why it wasn't a real investigation. Okay. The first time, uh, back in September 2010, <coughs> because they simply wanted to prove that there was no new evidence. So when I said... I, I remember the conversation with the policeman. He said, come to Scotland Yard, we're going to arrest you. And I said, I'm in Canterbury. You know where I am. It's a 50-mile drive. Come and arrest me here. And instead of doing that, they just wrote no evidence. Paul McMullen, no new evidence. And I thought, that's not an investigation. That's a lie. So I thought we had a chance to bring down the government, actually. And after that, I went to Max Clifford, who's a famous publicist, and I said, look, we could bring down the government here because we can prove, well, we can't really prove much because we haven't got any evidence, but if we make enough public noise and show that, while I agree that hacking into phones is all a good thing, but if we can show that <coughs> Rebecca Brooks is the criminal in chief uh, and who knew, and Andy Coulson knew all about these crimes and they helped mould the British Prime Minister and got him elected, um, we can um, show that that election wasn't fair and they'll have to hold a new one. And then with all the policemen <coughs> failing to investigate at all properly, that's quite a good story. Mm. So that's when I started saying, I hacked into people's phones, I paid the police lots of money, I'm in Canterbury, woo, come and arrest me. 
and the police also were saying, "Will you shut the fuck up as well?" So uh, was they implicated. They they were yeah they wanted it to go away more than as much as anyone. Yeah. And now. Uh, now there's a new team investigating it. <coughs> well, they had to. I mean, Operation Wheating. The, the Guardian, the TV, uh, me and Sean Hoare, I think, made enough noise, and a few Labour MPs got on the back of that and said, "Look, we really should do this properly." And eventually, they gave in. Oh, there's Millie Dowler's phone. So, um, and that's what we thought. Right, one nil. Gotcha. You still don't want to help the police, but you're not angry enough <laughs> with Coulson and Brooks to do just that. Uh, no, I don't, I don't want to uh, put anyone in jail. I'm just making mischief, really, um, having fun. <laughs> no, and it's a great story. It's, it, I think it's the British Watergate, and I, I was pleased to have a chance to get it moving. I mean, most of the credit goes to Sean Hall. He had much better evidence. <coughs> but because I'd been in Features, and Rebecca Brooks had been Features editor, I knew how that department worked, so the pair of us together have been able to... Um, Really shake Mr. Cameron and his party. You, you, you the, the compare it with Watergate. Is this the end of the era where the newspapers, the tabloids, especially the Murdoch papers, have such a firm grip on British politics? Um, oh, I think it is. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, no one wants to be associated with him. I mean, if you want to lose an election, you go with Murdoch previously, uh, as you remember. I mean, Maggie Thatcher. 1979 was it said you know I'll let you buy the times if you support me she, so she became prime minister Tony Blair flew to Sydney support me it's, it's the son backs Blair two days later he won then Cameron gets into bed with um, uh, Rebecca Brooks probably not literally but I don't know <laughs> and no, that was just Rupert Murdoch that's a great rumor not true at all by the way but no it could be who knows and um, yeah so and then he became prime minister uh, but now, if anyone were to go up to Rupert Murdoch and say, can you make me Prime Minister, they say, you're nuts, you know. So, uh, yes, his power uh, is end has ended, I think, in uh, British politics. Two weeks ago, there was some Tories saying, when Ed Miliband spoke out against the Murdochs, he's committing political suicide. But that shows how... Oh, I see, yeah, yeah, how, how fantastically it has changed. I mean, Rebecca Brooks used to be one of the most feared women in Britain, but now um, she, she's a slightly sad case. And I'll tell you a quick story about how I quit the News of the World, if you like. I can't remember if I've told it before, but um, after seven years of working undercover quite a lot, and uh, there are sacrifices to make when you do that, um, I was sent undercover for a year. Uh, do you know this story? Yeah. And um, she... Um, uh, she, I thought she was a terrible editor with really bad ideas, to be honest. And uh, she wanted to report on, <coughs> you know, real Britain. Um, it, and she wanted me to live on a council estate, <coughs> uh, two hundred yard, uh, two hundred miles from my house, where I just got married, just had a baby, and was just starting life uh, for a whole year. I, I thought it was a joke. And she said, "No, you, uh, you are a news of the world reporter. You have no personal life. You must devote your life to." The paper, and you should be proud to have this assignment. This is going to be a great story. It's not. No, it's not. It's rubbish. People want to know what Robbie Williams is doing with a supermodel, not what he's doing. He's the postman. Are you mad? <laughs> and uh, so I, I refused to go, and um, I left. I wasn't fired, and I didn't quit. We just came to an agreement. Okay, well then you leave them. And then <clears throat> after my last check cleared, I got a job at the Express. Uh, about two days afterwards, and Rebecca Brooks, what a lovely woman, sent uh, her managing editor to talk to my new boss, the editor of the Express, and list all my failures and shortcomings and why he really shouldn't be employing me. So nice, but luckily he said, um, you know, if Rebecca Brooks doesn't want you to work for me that much, <laughs> that's great. And get get back to work. So no, it, it was good. And he promoted me as well. Actually, so it was all right. Yeah. Do you, you you've been defending what's been happening, the phone hacking. Yeah. So no remorse at all whatsoever, actually. No, I mean it does sound like a contradiction that I can defend uh, all forms of open journalism. I think you should do anything to get a story because fundamentally, you're just writing in a newspaper. You're not really hurting anybody. 
Um, you just if you write the truth and try and get as close to the truth, what's wrong with writing the truth? It's the best we can do, by any means possible. But for me then to turn round and say, well, Rebecca Brooks thought exactly the same, but she's a filthy criminal, um, does sound like a contradiction. But unfortunately, it was too good a story to miss because of her links with the British Prime Minister, the police, mm. and the way the whole thing's crumbling around us mm. just because of that. So in a sense, I support her, but I wish she'd been a bit more honest. Because that makes it a bit cynical. Eh? You say we're in the business of exposing the truth, but it seems like News of the World and News International, even maybe James Murdoch, did their best to hide it. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, yes, well, am I allowed to call them a liar? I think James, the problem was inexperience. Rebecca Brooks wasn't, didn't have any proper journalistic training, and I don't think James Murdoch has either, because he made one obvious error when he was talking to Parliament, saying how you know, he just believed that it had been one rogue reporter, uh, Clive Goodman, the royal editor, and then, you know, this is the reason why uh, he wasn't trying to silence the people when he paid them a lot of money, but, you know, it just didn't want to have legal expenses. And then, so one of them was Max Clifford, the publicist, fair enough, and the other one was Gordon Taylor. Um, so, yeah, yeah so, so a football story. And it's like, oh, you've just said there's only one reporter, the royal editor. The royal editor would never do a football story. God, don't you know the first thing about journalism? You're supposed to be the mega boss. So uh, he might go to jail for that, because that's a big mistake, really. Cause Does that expose that he actually knew about it? Well, it certainly should do. And um, Parliament is a court in Britain. It's the highest court in the land. And lying in a court is perjury, which I think is two and a half years in jail. Oh dear, Rupert's son might go to prison. Yeah. And many people said that's why he closed the paper, that so his son you know, wouldn't get arrested. Yeah. We're gonna, probably going to see the abolishment of the Press Complaints Commission. Yeah. And there's talk about, should, we, should there still be self-regulation or do we need a statutory it, laws I, to control it? Do you think it's going that direction? <coughs> that would be terrible and the end. I mean, who wants the government to control the press? I mean, Stalin did, Adolf Hitler did, Gaddafi did, you know, all the worst countries in the world have a state-controlled press. You have to have, in a free democracy, a free press. If we go down that route, I'm going to leave the country.